This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 120, recorded February 11th, 2011. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and it's time for TWIB, the podcast all about viruses. Today, we are in Alexandria, Virginia, and I'm with Rich Condit. Hey, Rich. Hello, Vincent. Here we are together again in the yeah. same room. How about yeah. that? That doesn't happen a lot, but now and then we are. And I guess we should explain why we're in the same room and why we're in Alexandria, Virginia. So Rich and I were just at a study section, which is a, uh, a mechanism by which the NIH decides uh, which grant applications it should pay or fund, right? Right. Of course, we don't make funding decisions. No, right? we don't. We just we, we just are the rate peer, the We are the first level of peer review, and so we judge the science and uh, try and decide which grants are meritorious and pass those recommendations on to higher authorities who determine yes. who's actually going to get money. <laughs> Good summary. So we just did that for a day and a half, and we thought uh, while we were here, we'd meet up with an old friend of yours who right. lives here in Alexandria, Virginia, and that's Ed Niles. Welcome to TWIV, Ed. Well, welcome, Vincent. Welcome to Alexandria. Rich, it's always good to see you. Good to be here. Rich has talked about you for a long time. I hope he spoke well of me. <laughs> of course. <laughs> He's got a lot of good stories, too. Maybe we'll get to a couple of them today. Yeah, I'd like to. But uh, we have... We've talked about you in, in the context of where you're working now, so we thought we would talk about that today because you went from an academic virologist to now in a government position. So from the beginning, <laughs> I know you're from Troy, New York, right? Oh, yes. I, I was brought up in Troy, New York. It's a, an old upstate industrial town on the Hudson River. Uh, it's, uh, I guess it's uh, most famous for being the home of the actual Uncle Sam. Uh, it's also the home of uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. What's the actual Uncle Sam? There was a man. Uh, <laughs> there is a man uh, named um, Samuel, and I can't remember what his last name it was. But uh, he was a butcher during the World of 1812, uh, and he supplied uh, uh, meat to the military. And on the meat that he shipped, he stamped U.S. on it. Uh -huh. That's how the story is told, and uh, so that's where. Uncle Sam came from. Uh, that's a great and story. So, uh, yeah, so the the, the uh, icon that one sees of the tall, thin man with the top hat uh, mm -hmm. is a representative of, uh, of this fellow. Wow, Troy, New York. Where'd you go to college? I was an undergraduate at uh, State University of New York in Buffalo, where I was a biology major. And uh, I was a graduate student at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. Uh, where I received a degree in biochemistry and was trained as a, a classic enzymologist. Hmm. Um, subsequent to that, uh, I was a postdoctoral fellow uh, in a laboratory of uh, Bill Summers uh, at Yale University, where I met Rich. Hmm. Uh, I joined uh, Bill's lab to learn about uh, dictyostelium discoidium development. Uh, that's what I plan to spend my uh, life's work on. But before you know it, that work uh, went fallow. And uh, I switched over to a project ongoing in his lab to uh, study bacteriophage T7 gene expression. Uh, and that's where Rich and I joined forces and did a series of experiments together. So when did we meet? It was like 1971 uh, or 70? 72. 72? 1972, yeah. Now, Rich told a story about uh, you and T7. So those were the origins of that story. Beginning, it, we used to, so you worked on the bacteriophage in Bill Summers' lab. What aspect of T7? Well, as a biochemist, I was interested in the product of T7 gene one. That was the gene that controlled uh, viral gene expression. Um, initially, following the example of T4, uh, many people felt. How appropriate, the Journal of Bio <laughs> Biological Chemistry <laughs> comes through the mail slot. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. You don't even have to edit that out. That's pretty good. Yeah, the mailman just, <laughs> we, I stopped talking because the door, the door was making noise and the Journal of Biological Chemistry just popped through. This is all happening in Ed's living room, by the way. Yeah. It's funny. Sorry, go ahead, Ed. 
Uh, so at any rate, um, uh, there was a project on T7 Gene 1 that would, needed someone to work on it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I picked up that project. And recently, uh, prior to my joining the lab, Mike Chamberlain, uh, who was at UC Berkeley, had demonstrated that T7 Gene 1 made an RNA polymerase. And so um, that interested uh, me. Uh, and so I worked along with a fellow named Steve Conlon uh, purifying the T7 RNA polymerase and defining its physical characteristics. And uh, the uh, uh, wonderful property of this enzyme to make specific transcripts in vitro. And so that uh, struck me as being a, a nice avenue for the rest of my life's research. Of course, that didn't turn out either. Uh, but the project that uh, you and Rich had discussed before was the fact that we were interested in mapping these transcripts. Uh, and in the days before recombinant DNA technology, uh, our approach was to do in vitro translation of the messages that we purified both from uh, wild type DNA and from DNA that contained uh, amber mutations in 19 different genes. And so we identified the relationship of the transcripts to the genetic map by looking for um, the elimination of a protein uh, in an amber mutant in comparison to the wild type uh, gene products. And so that was, even to today, that was uh, among my uh, most favorite sets of experiments. Yeah, it was really a satisfying project. Yeah, it was really a nice and project. One of the things, one of the things that I like to point out is, you know, through my career, I've not been necessarily the most collaborative person, right? I'm on a pretty short <laughs> leash. I don't get very far from my bench, uh, and but somehow, somehow there was a chemistry. Somehow we hit it off. Okay, and I had to walk all the way. I can. I can still remember this march all the way down one corridor in the, from the basement of Sterling Hall of Medicine. I was in a different lab. And then take a right and down another corridor. And then there was this rickety old elevator that went up to the, what was it, the fourth floor? Fourth floor. Yeah. Fourth floor of radiobiology, which was a hole in the wall. Uh, yes, it was. It was amazing. Yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, I would do that. You'd get in like some ridiculous hour, like 6.30 or something like that. Well, we had two small kids, and so my job was to get up and out of the house before the kids woke up, uh, because if I woke them up, then that meant uh, the day started early for my mm -hmm. wife, and so <laughs> that's why I was in. So, so I'd get in and make coffee and take a uh, t take a cup of coffee up to visit Ed almost every morning, and he was already running gels. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And we'd talk and hang out, and the projects just kind of grew out of that. I mean, what we had in common was T7 to start with. But, uh, so you were there together for how many years? A couple of years? Four? Uh, did you well, leave no. before I did? You left. You, know, you went off to England in the fall of 74. And no, I, no, 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 no. Uh, oh, well, yeah, okay, sure. okay, okay, okay. Uh, January, January 70, 75. January 75. Yeah, and I, I moved to Buffalo the following August. Okay. Rich, you were a postdoc at Yale. No, I was a graduate student. With, Ed was a postdoc. Uh, with Joan Stites. Right. Okay, we're going to put a link to that wonderful movie we made in, at your house, Rich, okay. where we explain the T7 connection. Put a link to the paper, too, because sure. actually there's another cool thing about that paper. Ed and I are the only authors. Ed was in Bill's lab, and I was in Joan's lab, but Joan had this uh, tradition sure. of not putting her name on papers if she uh, felt like... Uh, uh, she had not made a major contribution, uh, and um, yeah, yeah. so she really wanted to promote the career of uh, people in her lab and, and, and kept that on, and Bill did the same thing in this case. That was very generous of them, and, yeah, and really cool. It's nice to, nice to have that. So you were a po uh, Ed, you were a postdoc uh, at With Yale. With Bill Summers, yeah. A postdoc. You finished your postdoc. You, you did a project on T7. Right, and then... And then um, then in, I guess it was just, I think the last time I went to a phage meeting was the summer of 74, uh, and then the world of molecular biology changed. And those are, pardon me for interrupting, the phage meetings. It's another whole topic, yeah. okay? Cold Spring in Harbor, right? Cold Spring yeah. Harbor, before it was a big deal. You know, when, uh, you know uh, when the bar was a refrigerator full of beer with a basket on the top, you heat chucked a quarter into and ripped off a beer. <laughs> it was great. It was really sad. Yeah, it was. It was, uh, it was a really nice time. So at any rate, I had done what I thought was a pretty nice set of studies on T7, and I was looking for a job, and I really wasn't getting much interest. And so 
it was clear that the world of uh, phage molecular biologists and everyone else was moving into eukaryotic systems, uh, largely eukaryotic viruses, but also with the uh, new technology available, it was time to look at, uh, uh, look at higher organisms. And so I had become committed to studying transcription mechanisms. Uh, at Yale at that time, they used to have a monthly postdoc meeting uh, where they would feed us and, and keep us around with alcohol in the evening. Uh, and so I used to go to those regularly because it was free, and I've never been one to turn down a free meal. And at one of the meetings, some of the faculty would come uh, and be there to interact. And so at one of the meetings, I sat at a table with Joe Gall, and uh, he was a renowned cell biologist, uh, is still a renowned cell biologist. And he started talking about isolating uh, a ribosomal RNA gene from a ciliated protozoan, Tetrahymena piriformis. And I thought, great, that's exactly what I need, because what I would need to do is be able to have a, a gene to study in vitro, and especially a gene that had, had uh, chromatin associated with it. Uh, because if you're going to study transcription, you need to have a template, and you need to define that the RNA that uh, is made is a primary transcript because notions of capping and, and other uh, post-transcriptional modifications were just becoming known. And so um, I stopped working on T7 one day and I started working on tetrahymen the next day. And, and fortunately, Bill was the sort of guy who would support that kind of transition. Uh, and so I devoted uh, the next, uh, much of the next 10 years of my life uh, to looking at uh, tetrahymena performance, our DNA structure and transcription and RNA processing. And it was during this period uh, that Rich grew up uh, and was looking for a job. <laughs> uh, and so he came through Buffalo Are you looking sure for of that? a job. Well, right. uh, temporally. So you had a, you left Yale at some point. When 1975. To Buffalo. So yeah. Buffalo was your job. That was right? my job. Yeah, uh, and I was plenty happy to have it. Yeah, it was. Uh, um, it was for me. It was nice to go back to Buffalo. Being from upstate yeah. New York, it was familiar territory. And having been an undergraduate there, uh, and they were fine years as they were everywhere in the 60s, pretty much. Um, they were fine years in Buffalo, and so I was happy to go back. And Joan and I had two small kids. Uh, we were able to buy a home, uh, a 10 minute walk away from campus. And I have to say my life in Buffalo was really very nice and I have nothing but uh, fond memories of that period. So this, it should be noted here that one can have a good life in Buffalo. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we had a good life in Buffalo. It Buffalo's has a bad a nice, rap, unfortunately. No, nah, Buffalo is a nice place to live. It is. So no, Rich, you, joined, Rich joined the department. Uh, after you were already there. After yeah. I was there for three years and, and ideally it was arranged so his laboratory juxtaposed mine and there were two doorways uh, that joined the two labs and we immediately took the doors off. And so uh, there was a great period of cross fertilization. You and must have had some role in Rich coming to Buffalo. Yeah, right? I worked hard at it, yeah. Um, you didn't have so. to work all that hard. No. But I mean, as I've already uh, outlined, this was a special relationship. Yeah, it's very interesting. And, uh, and the, uh, the opportunity to extend that indefinitely uh, uh, when adjoining labs. I mean, from a sort of a science uh, buddy's uh, perspective, that's uh, really cool. It was. We used to, um, well, we both walked to work or rode our bikes uh, when the time of year when it's possible to ride your bike. Uh, but virtually every night we walked home together. Rich lived a few blocks and was in the same direction. So we'd walk home and and uh, invariably talk about the day's dealings. And uh, 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 we spent a lot of time uh, with each other. Uh, and our, I think we work together well because we don't think about science in the same way. Uh, I'm very much a sort of uh, KM VMAX kind of guy, uh, and which is not. And so <laughs> that's not. good because uh, it's, uh, you can't have two of these sorts of people working on the same project, right? You really need to have blended interests. I was telling Vincent today about this game we used to play, where just as an example of how well we knew each other's science, and the game was you bring in an autoradiogram, which for you know the uninitiated listeners is a piece of X-ray film that's got dark bands on it and stuff that's data from an experiment. And to if you don't know what's going on, it just looks like a bunch of you know marks on a film, all right? And the game was one of us would walk into the other's office or lab with his film and just slap it down and the other guy had to uh, figure out what the experiment was 
and what the data were and mm -hmm. interpret it with no, no labeling on the film right. or anything else. And we're pretty good at it. Good. Yeah, yeah. Well, we talked about what we were doing, of yeah. course. So you knew what the next experiment was right. going to be. You knew how the, how the guy loaded his gels, where the markers mm -hmm. were, so he could orient it right and figure it all out. And you were always really good at coming up with the alternate explanations. I'd say, here's the interpretation, you know, of my own experiments. And you'd say, well, did you think about this? Did you think about this? Did you think about this? And of course, the answer was no, no, no. Okay. And uh, forced me to go back and do some more controls. It was all good. It's pretty rare in science that someone else takes an interest in your, what you're doing, because as you said earlier, we're all independent business people. We start a lab, it's our place, and you don't interact much with anyone else. Yeah. yeah, well, I think it's, uh, you know, it's like uh, any good relationship. Um, you're friends before you become involved in your business or your marriage, and then you're much better off, right? And that was true this way as well, because uh, there, there wasn't any competition. There was a lot of trust. And so, you know, that all of that makes things work. Basically. Good criticism is hard to find, yeah. and it's really it's, necessary to make it work yeah. right. Yeah. So at what point did you switch from tetrahymena? Well, I ran into grant problems. Something that's common now wasn't so common in 1980, but uh, uh, when I started my tetrahymena work, I received an R01, and then I had it renewed. And I presumed this would go on forever, uh, <laughs> but it didn't for me first. And I, I was the first person I think I knew who didn't get a grant renewed uh, on a successful project. Um, so at any rate, uh, I eventually was able to get the grant funded for one more cycle. But in the meantime, it forced me to think about other things. And of course, having had experience with T7 and with Rich's tutelage uh, in his uh, growing vaccinia world, um, it was just of interest to me. I mean, we spent a lot of time talking to each other about experiments, and so I knew a lot about, uh, about the system. So we started off on a collaborative project together, which was to um, uh, define the gene order and content of a segment of this 200 KB vaccinia genome. And we selected a fragment that had a series of TS mutants that Rich had grossly mapped to that region. And we felt that it would be an opportunity for us to uh, provide a genetic handle in terms of identifying the function of the gene products from uh, the D fragment. And so NSF bought into that for a couple of cycles and gave us the support to learn how to do DNA sequencing the Sanger fashion um, and uh, to put these genes together. And it was, it was a great project. Um, and so we defined this sequence of DNA uh, in great detail. And we've gone on to contribute to understanding what the uh, uh, gene products did. Uh, among those gene products were two that make uh, the subunits of the vaccinia mRNA capping enzyme. And so again, I hearkened back to my uh, initial training as an enzymologist and decided to focus uh, some of our efforts on capping. And in the meantime, Rich moved to Florida. So that ended this official collaboration. Uh, but then I spent uh, much of the next 10 years or so working on the capping enzyme, trying to understand its basic organization and uh, the mechanism of cap formation. Uh, in the meantime, Stu Schumann had uh, demonstrated that the capping enzyme was also a required transcription termination factor. So that appealed to my sense of my earlier days of transcription. And so those studies expanded into uh, uh, another long series of projects that related to understanding aspects of the mechanism of of transcription termination. And so with a whole series of side projects along uh, uh, the path, on vaccinia. That's what most of my work uh, had to do with uh, in vaccinia. And so it's a, a wonderfully fertile virus that has endless questions. It's fascinating uh, to me still. So from 75 till when you were in Buffalo? Uh, Joan and I moved in 2008. Uh, we came to, I had a, a period of time um, in sort of my mid 50s when I realized that my scientific career was going, it wasn't going to go on forever. And well, could it have? Could you have kept working in your lab and get grants, or did you see that it was getting harder and harder to do it's, that? It was never easy for me to keep a research yeah. project funded. I always managed to do it for the 33 years that I was there, but it was never automatic, that's for sure. And uh, it always required a, well, as well it should, it required a significant effort. Nothing that I complain about, but uh, the reality is that I felt by the time I was getting into my late 50s that 
my work was becoming less and less competitive. Like, that's the way I felt. Okay. Could I have kept a program going? If I felt it was important enough, I think I could have, uh, based on having always done it. Why not? Um, but it, is, it isn't what I wanted to do. And so uh, the last grant that I received uh, started in uh, 2003. I decided that would be the last grant I was going to apply for. Um, and except for an R21, uh, it was. And so I decided that uh, when 2008 came along, uh, I was going to end that aspect of my career. I did not want to be a university professor at the university without a research laboratory. Uh, my uh, university identity, my own personal identity, uh, was fully wrapped up in my role as an active researcher. And I felt that my laboratory should go to somebody else. Uh, and they should have the opportunity that I had. And so I was perfectly happy to end that uh, on a, uh, I guess, uh, in my way, uh, in a way that I was uh, quite satisfied and remained satisfied. Uh, I felt confident that uh, there'd be other things to do, uh, and it turned out to be true. But you hadn't, when you stopped, you hadn't planned on something else to do? Well, um, I'm a planful person, so that's not <laughs> quite true. I mean, okay. all... Uh, all of us type A's really are looking to the future all the time. So, you know, I, I put some thought okay. into it. Yeah. Uh, Joan and I have two children, uh, and uh, our son lives in Charlotte, and our daughter lives in Arlington, Virginia, right across the Potomac from Washington. And so each of our children have two grandchildren, and being doting grandparents, we want to be able to spend time with, uh, with our families. Mm -hmm. And so Although we, live, we uh, really enjoyed our life in Buffalo and have many uh, wonderful friends there, we decided it was time for a change and that we wanted to live closer to one of our kids. Uh, what made sense to me was to move to the D.C. area because I thought there'd be an opportunity for me to get a job in D.C. Uh, uh, much more readily than in uh, Charlotte. And although I had no idea what that job might be, I, didn't, I presumed it would be a part-time job um, and that I would do whatever came along. Uh, it turned out that a real job came along, and so, so that's what I'm doing. So you were already here when this job came along? Well, no, again, being planful, I looked into the future. <laughs> and I, I, I interacted, I, I wrote to friends that I have who work for the government, and uh, uh, I told them that uh, Joan and I would be moving to the area in the fall, and if they knew of any job openings, uh, to please let me know. And I kept track of jobs online, uh, jobs in the Washington Post that I thought might be... You interested. also did that sort of mini sabbatical, right? Yes, I did. I managed to be able, because a project in my laboratory uh, when I was trying to develop antivirals against pox viruses, uh, that project was supported by a local um, company who was interested in, in biodefense, uh, and that in conjunction with money from New York State. Uh, that I had a relationship with this company, and this company also had an, has an office in Washington. And I thought that um, I would be a, it would be beneficial to myself and also to the university for me to spend three months uh, in Washington mm -hmm. uh, at their Washington office. Uh, and my goal was to try to find ways to provide access to UB's professors to various funding sources in Washington other than NIH. Mm. Uh, and so... Uh, that was how I spent those three months. But importantly, um, we spent those three months in uh, Alexandria. That's where Joan and I rented a place. And so we kind of, kind of got used to the lifestyle in Alexandria and enjoyed what we uh, saw. And so when we were looking for a place to live, we decided we would live in Virginia and either Arlington or Alexandria, and here we are. So you ended up at Barda, yes. which is where you are now. So let's talk a bit about BARDA. What, is, what does BARDA stand for? Uh, that stands for the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority. It is part of the Department of Health and Human Services. And uh, if in your mind you can, you can uh, consider an organizational tree, uh, the Department of Health and Human Services is, has many sub-departments. One is the Office of the Secretary. Mm -hmm. Underneath the office of the secretary are many other departments, and on the same level are the FDA, NIH, the CDC, and then there is something called the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response, ASPR. Under ASPR is BARDA, along with another whole set of, of programs, and under BARDA is something called CBRN, that stands for Chemical 
biological, nuclear, and radiological. And so everything within ASPR is uh, geared towards preparedness and prevention of any sort of activity that you can imagine. Was that all, was ASPR born out of 9-11? ASPR was born out of 9-11. Okay. Yes, it was born out of the office of the secretary and a precursor program was initiated by D.A. Henderson, uh, who okay. was famous for his uh, efforts in eliminating smallpox mm -hmm. in the World Eradication Program. Uh, so through uh, DA's efforts, uh, he uh, initiated, in many ways, the biodefense program that we see today okay. uh, through his interactions with Tommy Thompson, who was then the Secretary of uh, Health and Human Services in the first term of the Bush administration. So uh, their job, uh, although I'm not sure that they viewed it this way from the get-go, but their job ended up being the, the development of this whole branch of government that exists today. So the, um, the impetus wasn't 9-11 per se, but the, the very... Well, from DA's point of view, the impetus, I think, uh, probably rested in the Russian uh, smallpox development program that he was aware of. Uh, and after 9-11, there was a concern about terrorism in general. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that he uh, enlightened people in government about bioterrorism uh, as an entity uh, that needed to be considered. Not only smallpox, but soon after this was the anthrax uh, event. Mm -hmm. So then that right. event uh, solidified this notion of uh, bioterrorism and biodefense uh, in people's minds. I didn't realize the role of D.A. Henderson in this. Yeah, I hadn't really realized. I, I guess I, I was vaguely aware of it, but uh, uh, this really solidifies that. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, well, he's, you know, he's been in government for a long time, and he's, he has had a substantial impact, and he, had, he plays a very active role today. Uh, he, he's well into his 80s. Uh, he, is, uh, he has a, a very strong voice, and um, uh, he expresses his opinions clearly, and he has them. Yes, um, He uh, was uh, the uh, main speaker at the recent ASM biodefense meeting in Washington uh, that was held last week, for an example. So, um, yeah, he's very active uh, in, in the medical world in general and biodefense in particular. So what does Barta do? Well, uh, the story is, a, is, let me see if, how I can get into this story. Um, in 2004, a law was passed called um, BioShield Law. And the BioShield law uh, was set up in order to supply funding to procure uh, antivirals and vaccines directed against a whole bunch of agents of biodefense interest. And there are, are lists of agents of biodefense interest, roughly equivalent to the category ABC agents that uh, NIH publishes. Uh, and so the notion, I think, it's, I, I wasn't here at the time, but I believe the notion was that there would be vaccines, there would be uh, antivirals, and there would be antibiotics to purchase to put into uh, strategic national stockpiles so that they would be available were there an event of any kind, whether it be natural or whether it be a bioterrorist event. Um, it turns out, of course, that there was not a large supply of antivirals uh, or uh, vaccines that were available for these agents. And so it became abundantly clear that this money was not going to be able to be spent for procurement until there were commodities to procure. And so that law was amended uh, in um, 2006 by uh, the PAPA legislation. I think that stands for the uh, Public uh, All Hazards Preparedness Act. And what that did is that extended uh, the notion uh, to BARDA of having a, an advanced development component. And so, uh, and it also put BARDA in a position to attempt to integrate the research activities of the various commodities in government so that there would be conversation and there would be a common purpose and an opportunity to prevent overlap in development. Uh, and in many ways, I think that that, is, that, that has That almost succeeded. sounds wise. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> so, <laughs> and so uh, now I think there's a reasonably close interaction among uh, NIH, uh, the Department of Defense, uh, uh, BARDA itself, uh, in order to be able to try to coordinate these development programs. And uh, what I've come to understand is that the Department of Defense has its own set of priorities uh, and its own 
uh, funding to do its own development from basic research all the way through procurement. On the health and human services side, uh, this whole uh, machinery is set up differently. Uh, you have the National Institutes of Health, which is responsible for early stage uh, experimentation and proof of principle. Uh, and now we have BARDO, which is responsible for late stage development and acquisition. And so the idea is that there, and there is also now coordination between the military and health and human services in order to be able to see which programs uh, mm. we can share. And so the idea then is that there is a pipeline, either of vaccine um, uh, uh, components or of uh, drugs directed against a variety of agents. And you can imagine that as research is done, this pipeline narrows and eventually you're going to get commodities that would be worth uh, licensing by the FDA or getting approval by the FDA. What kind of viruses are on the, the list of, of BARDA's charge? Well, BARDA's charge, everything was prioritized because, of course, there was, you know, some things were more important than others, at least in people's minds, and um, there's only a certain amount of money. And so a BARDA is divided, uh, a BARDA has several programs. I'm only going to talk about the CBRN program. But one of the other programs that's, that uh, has received a, notor a lot of notoriety is the flu program. So the influenza group at BARDA is responsible for all the government procurement uh, related to influenza and late stage development. And so uh, they were quite prominent during the um, recent H1N1 oh, so flu they, pandemic. So the vaccine and antiviral procurement was done under By these BARDA, guys. and yes. that was released to the public as Correct. well, right? Yeah. As a matter you, of fact, you went down, yeah. Yeah. I mean, all of us had to play a minor role in that. The guys in flu, of course, had the full responsibility, but because it was such a grand scale operation uh, that uh, they called on people throughout BARDA to play a role. And so many of us uh, participated in being the federal employee who was present for delivery of vaccine or delivery of ancillary items and so is that only something that would happen for flu at least in a pandemic year or would it happen seasonally if there were large outbreaks uh well i think it would probably happen seasonally if it's a large enough outbreak uh, you know um but you don't have a role in procuring yeah. vaccines for seasonal influenza no no these guys do they, they do they also do they set okay. up the see the whole program for government flu as far as i know goes through this program they decide who, uh, what's, you know, I mean, they're not doing it in a vacuum. There is a whole flu community at, sure, at the sure. CDC and who, who decides what strains are going to be the components of the vaccine and on and on. But these guys do the procurement. Uh, and they have been given the responsibility. They assumed the responsibility of the distribution during uh, uh, 2009. Hmm. So, I didn't realize that either. Something else I learned. Yeah. Uh, well, no, you know, it's not just bioterrorism. You went down and watched them unload trucks or something. Yes, right? I did. I went uh, to Dallas, Texas, and uh, or Grapevine, Texas, that's more appropriate, and to Columbus, Ohio. Yeah. So I got to see how this whole operation works. It's pretty fascinating. Uh, you know, there is, I mean, at, uh, y you find flu vaccine in your local physician's office or in a clinic or in a drugstore. And the associated uh, syringes and needles and the swipes and the gloves, all of this is part of the program. Those things didn't happen by accident. Uh, they were all shipped from a supplier to each of these outlets. And BARDA played a role in overseeing that. Each of the states were responsible for their own distribution appropriately. Is that the only common infection, influenza, that is taken care of? What is, what are the, what is the acronym again? For, for <laughs> BARDA. The, not BARDA, but above BARDA, C. Oh, Asper. 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 Yeah. Uh, there's another one, C something. Uh, CBRN. CBRN. Yeah, that's where we haven't gotten to the point of what I actually do. <laughs> CBR, CBRN. It's okay. CBRN. That's chemical, biological, nuclear, and radiologic. So they yeah. take care of the flu program? No, uh, no, the flu group takes care of the flu. And the flu so group both of those are sub, subdivisions of BARDA. 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 Should, we okay. should have made a, we should Sorry, have a blackboard chart. With a flu but I want to know, yeah. besides flu, are there any yearly infections that uh, BARDA deals no. with vaccines. It's no. just flu. The it's rest flu. is, is bioterrorism related. That's correct. Okay. Right. Got it. Right. And, and what are some of those? Today? Okay. So within CBRN, uh, just to make, say a few words about the others, um, there are groups of people who are interested in developing and acquiring antidotes to chemical poisons, mm -hmm. uh, uh, 
uh, antidotes for radiological uh, poisons uh, or events and nuclear events. Uh, so right. it's not just biologic. Okay. Uh, within the biologic group, there is a listing of, of agents uh, for which there is an interest. And at the top of the list uh, are three. Uh, there is anthrax. Uh, and so BARDA is interested in developing and acquiring vaccines mm -hmm. uh, against anthrax and uh, uh, antitoxins. Then there is the botulinum toxin. We're interested in developing agents against uh, the various strains of uh, Clostridium botulinum. Uh, and their, their, their toxins. And uh, all of this, all of these agents start to go into stockpiles to be distributed only if there is a need. And then there's smallpox. And so for smallpox, um, there is a vaccine story and there is an antiviral story. Uh, and at the time uh, when I was hired, uh, it made sense for me to be, to participate in the smallpox program based on my background with vaccinia. So the smallpox vaccine program uh, is a multi-leveled program. There is um, a work that went on before I joined the group that's uh, now overseen by the CDC, and that is the uh, acquisition and maintenance of the stocks of ACAM 2000 uh, that are available. And tell us what that need. is. ACAM 2000 is a second generation smallpox vaccine uh, that was uh, developed by a company named Acambus. And uh, it is licensed uh, by the FDA, and uh, we have uh, several hundred million doses of this vaccine sitting in, in uh, the strategic national stockpile along with uh, uh, these bifurcated needles that are ne necessary to apply mm -hmm. the uh, vaccine in the old-fashioned way. Um, that stockpile is maintained by the CDC, and there uh, is... a. Uh, an interest in maintaining this. this is and that's just basically a plant purified, cell culture grown uh, derivative of the original Drivax vaccine. That's correct. Right? Drivax so was played cleaner and Cleaner and better defined. Right. But still, you get the same old vaccination. Right? You get the same old vaccination, it has the same old complications. Right. And this was this subjected to clinical trials or was yes. it was it was subjected to clinical trials and it was it was and continues to be distributed um, there was in 2003 perhaps uh, 2004 something like that um, there was an edict that uh, healthcare workers would be vaccinated mm -hmm. and during that uh, initial vaccination a number of cases of myocarditis became apparent that possibly were related to the vaccine and then that ended that program uh, however, the military uh, vaccinates uh, soldiers uh, that they're sending overseas, and so that uh, military vaccination program continues, and there are very careful records maintained of the uh, hmm. uh, of, of any vaccine-associated uh, issues that may And they're all getting appear. ACAM 2000. They're all getting ACAM And when I vaccinate people in my laboratory, they're getting ACAM 2000. That's correct. Drivax is, has been eliminated. There is no more Drivax. ACAM 2000 is... Frozen or lyophilized? It's lyophilized. So in, storage in is, is, is easy. Yeah. So yeah, just, to, just so. to remind people, um, the smallpox vaccination, as vaccines go, is, is unique. It's not like either an oral vaccination or an injection. It's uh, this thing where you uh, take what is a live virus uh, and scratch it into... Uh, your skin using a special bifurcated needle and you get this blistering lesion um, which is the limit of under normal conditions the pathogenesis and uh, it's closely enough related to smallpox so that you're immune to smallpox so it's a it's an unusual vaccination from that point of view yes so ACAM 2000 was procured in your program uh, it was procured by the CDC you, you didn't yeah. have anything to do with that? Uh, well, I, we don't have anything to do with any decisions associated with it, but we're all part of this yeah. governmental smallpox team. So, uh, for instance, uh, myself and my associate, Mike Merchlinski, um, do travel with the CDC group to visit sites where they're interested in still continuing to produce this vaccine, just okay. as an aside, but it's okay. the CDC's responsibility. Um, however, that gets us up to Boston from time to time, so that's okay. Is there another vaccine that you're working yes, on? Yes, there as well? is. A, a, the major development and acquisition program that's ongoing now is with an attenuated version of vaccinia called 
modified uh, vaccinia Ankara or MVA. And so that program uh, is being conducted with, uh, through a company named Bavarian Nordic that is headquartered in Munich, Germany, and their production occurs outside of Copenhagen, Denmark. Mm -hmm. uh, and these people have been responsible for developing uh, MVA into uh, a commodity that they call Invimmune. Uh, and so they're in the process of uh, producing uh, the vaccine and sending it to the U.S. on a periodic basis. I had found a uh, press release from Bavarian Nordic, complete smallpox vaccine phase two trial in vulnerable population. So I guess that's related to yes, that's right. this whole program. Yeah, they're, the, what, what they have to face, I and mean, one of their requirements uh, is that they uh, acquire licensure from the FDA. And so um, that is an obligatory requirement of receiving a uh, procurement grant. So contract. You've, you've said that there are still, with ACAM 2000, there are still side effects associated with a vaccine. Yes. Or, or there can be uh, at, at a certain frequency, and they Correct. can be, uh, actually, they can, they can even be lethal in yes. some people, but they can certainly be uh, uh, annoying. Um, uh, debilitating. The debilitating. can be right. infrequent. However, this, um, pretty much as, as, it's, as has always been true with the smallpox right. vaccine. And so MVA, as a, an attenuated vaccine, is uh, an, an attempt, a successful attempt, as I understand it, to uh, get around that, develop a vaccine that doesn't have those side effects, right? That's right. And I think that the, it's a very promising vaccine. Uh, it has had many promising and positive results uh, in their uh, safety and efficacy trials. Um, they, uh, because there is no natural disease, however, they, like everyone else we have to deal with, uh, have to confront uh, what is known as the animal rule. Uh, that is a, a now a component of the FDA's consideration. Uh, I'll, I can explain, I think, the conundrum of the animal rule on MVA is a good example. The FDA is, is faced with the awesome responsibility of licensing vaccines and approving drugs for human use. Uh, they take this very seriously. Uh, traditionally, uh, when one is interested in gaining licensure or approval, you carry out a clinical study in order to be able to demonstrate not only human safety, but efficacy of either the drug or the vaccine. In the case of agents of biodefense interest, since these agents are not uh, widely available, uh, one cannot carry out a standard clinical study in order to test efficacy. And so the FDA recognized this as being a fundamental problem in terms of being able to uh, license or approve uh, a drug or a vaccine. And so they uh, developed what is referred to as the animal rule. And what the animal rule requires is that uh, it's, easy to, it's easy to say in words, but it's not easy to uh, fulfill. And it requires that you demonstrate efficacy in an animal model that replicates the human disease. It makes perfect sense. The fundamental problem is it's impossible to find an animal model that fully replicates the human disease. Uh, we, have this, uh, we have this phrase we use all the time, uh, we have used on this show. Uh, what is it? Mice lie and monkeys, monkeys exaggerate. exaggerate. Right. That's right. right. That's why we call Sounds them models, right. right? So every one of these development companies is faced with uh, identifying and utilizing a series of animal models that will in total uh, replicate the human disease in some fashion that will satisfy the FDA. That is a notable challenge under the best of circumstances, in part because animal models that you or I might employ in the laboratory are not satisfactory to the FDA because they don't meet regulatory rigor. Uh, it, the types of experiments that uh, we would do in academic science where we're perfectly happy with the outcome and, and concluding a result are very different from the sorts of experiments that are required in order to meet uh, uh, the FDA's needs. Uh, and I understand it fully now, and I would never have understood it before having uh, been part of this job. What they need to have you do is demonstrate in an animal model that something works in a way that they can be certain that the outcome uh, has meaning, absolutely certain. And so that requires working under uh, conditions called good laboratory practice conditions. Now, 
we would all uh, bristle at the notion that people would think that we don't always work under good laboratory <laughs> practice conditions. Uh, but in fact, according to the regulatory rules, we never work under GLP conditions yeah. ever. Uh, because if you are working under GLP conditions, you're always recalibrating your micro pipettes. You're always validating the temperature on your water baths, uh, on the, the degrees uh, below zero in, free, in your freezer, and on and on and on. It's remarkably complex. However, uh, that's the way the business has always worked, and that's the way it continues to work. So uh, in the case of Bavaria Nordic and Invimune, uh, they are in the process of attempting to acquire the data that demonstrates efficacy in a variety of, of animal models that uh, will fulfill the FDA's needs. And that process remains ongoing. What are some of the models that are used? Well, uh, in the case of vaccines, uh, it's a little bit less stringent, uh, surprisingly, because vaccines in, against a virus as large as Varilla, there are many antigens, and many antigens are protective. And so uh, it's, it, in principle, it's not, not as rigid okay. as it might be for drug development, for example. Um, so the animal models are ectromelia in mice, a vaccinia in mice. Uh, you might do a... Uh, uh, a sub-Q in, uh, infection of rabbits or an aerosol infection of rabbits and look at rabbit pox protection, cowpox in mice. Um, but really the gold standards are non-human primates. So there has been a dearth of animal models uh, in non-human primates uh, for non-human primates. And so only in the past decade have people seriously attempted to develop them. And uh, that is an ongoing process. There is one model uh, that works well in the sense that it's completely reproducible and the data are consistent, and that involves an IV infection. Um, but other, inf other IV inf infection of what and what? Of uh, monkeypox into uh, macaques. Okay. That's not a natural route of infection, uh, and so that often raises issues with regulatory agents. So these are challenge experiments. These right? are challenge experiments. And I think it's yeah. <laughs> worthwhile pointing out that during this period, people drug out smallpox again, right? And they've been doing smallpox experiments in non-human primates as potential animal models. Is that uh, correct? Invimune has not. Invimune has not. That's correct. Okay. No, that's not necessary. At least the FDA has not has decided that that's not necessary. But to for some other purposes, challenge. this has been done. For drug development, uh, uh, okay. yes, it is, because okay. they, the drug has a single target. Right. And so it, it may make a difference okay. what the target virus is, yeah. So the phase two trial that Bavarian... Nordic is doing? What is that meant to assess? Uh, I can't remember. What's the title on it? Is it a safety and efficacy study? Or is this a, an efficacy study in non-human primates? It's, it's a study in uh, people with atopic dermatitis. Oh, yes. Okay. That's a safety and an immunogenicity study. Okay. Um, so, at any rate, uh, Invimune is the, the use uh, for Invimune uh, is for people who are immune compromised. Atopic dermatitis is one manifestation of an nice. immune uh, compromised condition. And so they were assessing the safety and immunogenicity of this vaccine in that population uh, as a, a way of measuring whether or not you would be able to apply the vaccine that it indeed was safe and that the uh, immune response was uh, high enough to be able to be confident that it would uh, be protective. Atopic dermatitis is also a classic contraindication for a regular smallpox correct, vaccination, yeah. right? right? Because smallpox, the uh, vaccinia likes to grow in broken skin. So if you have atopic dermatitis or eczema or something like that, and you vaccinate somebody, it spreads all over the place, and right. that causes a complication. So you need an alternative for those people. That's right. And, and it is argued uh, that there may be as many as 20% of the American population that would need to get a uh, vaccine uh, directed against people with special needs as opposed to ACAM uh, 2000. How is this uh, vaccine administered? That is administered as a, uh, uh, let's see, it is uh, stored as a frozen one um, shot vial uh, and it's administered by syringe. It's an IM, IM. injection, yeah. So that's why it, it's so not it's a problem injected. with people yeah. with contact or with uh, atopic. Right. Or MVA I, just basically doesn't grow, yeah. okay? Yeah. Or at least it doesn't go through its whole replication cycle in humans. It's, uh, I, I guess, basically an abortive infection, right? You get a little bit yeah, of gene expression? The, yeah, you do get some. You get early gene expression. Right. Um, and you don't get 
much like so you get enough to so you get enough to make a few antigens and that kind of stuff. Plus, there's the antigens that come. Yeah, with you're, the virus. you're putting in a load of virus right. uh, when you when you inject this. And uh, the the basic mechanism of immu immunization uh, is not the same uh, between uh, ACAM2000 and Imbimmune because ACAM2000 is a replicating virus, and so you go through the whole gamut of the immune response as the virus replicates. Um, this is a this the the uh, immune vaccination is a two dose vaccination, um, and much work needs to be done in order to refine this system, and that work is ongoing, and that's part of what these projects are all about. These vaccines would be given in the event of introduction of smallpox in, into the population, so they would be given post exposure, right? Uh, yes, they is would be correct? given. They, it would be presumed exposure, so yes, they would be post exposure. So if a, Smallpox were detected in New York City, the surrounding area would be immunized. That's that's the plan. That's the logical plan. And, yeah. But how much of the country would be immunized? We we don't know that. We don't know it that. Depends. But if it were localized to New York City, say, you would probably initially focus on that area until you saw cases elsewhere. I presume. I think that it remains to be seen how this would all be handled. Um, would BARDA be involved? Yes. Uh, it's the CDC's responsibility, but it would be our responsibility to make sure that the materials are provided. But the strategic national stockpile is under the, under the um, oversight of the CDC. So Bavaria Nordic has contracts from BARDA yes. to do the clinical trials and uh, to produce vaccine? Is that right? Some of these clinical trials, and I don't know about this one in particular, but NIA Ideas had played an important role in the development of Imbimune. Um, the initial studies carried out by, and current studies ongoing uh, by uh, uh, Bavaria Nordic, and also studies that NIAID uh, have done for themselves, have investigated various aspects of the uh, um, efficacy and safety of Imbimune. So NIAID for the listeners is National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, right. a branch one of the institutes of the National Institutes of Health, and its relationship to BARDA, it's like colleagues, colleagues, yeah, a parallel. Uh, well, not. Re I mean, basically, NIAID uh, their role uh, is uh, in early stage development, basic science and early stage development, and uh, figuratively. Their role goes up to the completion of a phase one safety uh, trial in humans. And that means all of the basic experiments that were conducted in order for a company to be able to apply for an investigative new drug uh, license from the FDA. Once they have an IND, this investigated uh, new drug um, uh, certification, then they can do the initial safety studies in humans. Because I've noted in talking to you that you interact a lot with people in NIAID, yeah. and that's so that your efforts are coordinated in the overall development of this kind right. of stuff. Right. BARDA was brought in specifically to address late-stage development, which is the later clinical studies, and also procurement. Okay. Initially, it was started specifically for procurement, but right. then, okay. you know, then... They realized they had to participate. They, they had to participate it's in It's expensive, the development. so we need... Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it, it is uh, remarkably expensive, but at any rate, we have close contacts with NIAID, in part because it's the job, uh, and in part because, of course, we have old friends up there. So it's, you know, it's easy to do that. Um, but we keep in close contact. As a matter of fact, one of my main uh, jobs is to oversee two contracts that are funded by BARDA but administered by NIAID. Okay. And so that keeps me in close contact uh, as well. Which is appropriate. That's good. Right. Oh, very much so. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, this is all about uh, communication and networking, and so um, uh, we, it, within the smallpox group, uh, we interact both with people at the CDC, people at the Department of Defense, and uh, at NIAID. So, um, and that's fundamental to doing the job. Have you been involved with the, the vaccine development? And if so, what kind of things do you do? Well, I'm less so involved in the vaccine development. More so with My the antivirals. My main role has been in uh, the antiviral drugs. But in terms of vaccine development, uh, what I actually do is serve as a subject matter expert, uh, which simply means being the guy who sits around and looks at the data and talks about it. Uh, uh, I read uh, experimental protocols that come in and mm -hmm. critique them. Uh, I look at the data and, and uh, 
critique the data. Uh, I come up with ideas. I talk about it, basically. So you using uh, your scientific skills, there's nothing new there, right? Yes. Is there anything new that you had to, to well, do? Well, what I've had to confront is uh, the complexity of government uh, <laughs> and, and the role of the FDA. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I had no, actually no knowledge of, uh, of regulatory um, uh, science and uh, the essential role that it plays in this process. Um, People often look at the FDA as being a stumbling block. Uh, I don't. I look at it as being a, uh, a, high, a high bar that needs to be mm. uh, mastered. and uh, uh, An appropriately high bar. An appropriately high bar, yeah. Right. Now, I, I, I have no negative uh, comments to make about the FDA at all. Is there a manual, or did you have to learn on there the job? There is no manual. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, what saved me from this, in, in this job, I started this job in November of 2008. I'll repeat what I've said uh, before, and that is that I knew uh, that I didn't know all the answers, um, but I was surprised to learn that I didn't know any of the answers and that I also didn't even understand the questions. And so <laughs> it required a complete transformation for me in order to be able to take, uh, to twist my brain to uh, uh, understand science in a different way. Uh, we all, for many years, of course, uh, do experimental science, uh, asking interesting questions and devising ways to answer them. Um, this sort of science is completely different. Uh, it's regulatory science, and it has to do with being uh, defining with great certainty uh, the answer to questions that invariably are not very interesting. I, know. <laughs> I have to say. Uh, uh, it's, it's interesting to be able to, uh, to understand that a vaccine or a drug is efficacious mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, that it's safe. That's great. I'm, I'm happy about that. Uh, but all of the different replications of all of the different models and all of the different variations um, I find to be scientifically tedious, but I understand how important they are, so I don't rebel at it. It's a very different, it's a different role to play entirely. As, uh, as, uh, my survival in this job uh, rests almost entirely uh, with a fellow named Mike Merschlinski, who uh, is also a pox virologist, uh, Rich and I have known for 25 years, uh, and he joined BARDA in January of 2009. Uh, his route was a bit different. He was a postdoc with Bernie Moss, and uh, he was a staff scientist at NIH, and then he moved to the FDA about 15 years ago, uh, and he was an FDA scientist. and. Uh, he divided his time between his laboratory and doing review of, uh, of applications and, and scientific uh, submissions. And so he learned all about the FDA, and he's quite competent, wonderfully knowledgeable in the workings of, uh, of government. And so he tutored me for the next six months about what my job was and to stop thinking in terms of Journal of Virology and start understanding that your scientific response is completely inappropriate to the situation that, <laughs> that we face. And so... Um, Re-educating uh, you is quite a project. It was a project. Right. You know? uh, and so uh, he did a, a, what I think is a wonderful job because uh, uh, as he's, he wryly uh, uh, comments from time to time that I'm the student who's correcting the mentor here, you know, because we have... Uh, Mike's the sort of guy uh, uh, where we go to lunch just about every day, and we talk about whatever's going on uh, in work, you know. And uh, you know, th this is—I I, just—I I was a sponge. I absorbed uh, uh, everything he had to say, and so um, it, it's been a, a wonderful relationship. And he's really good at what he does. So let's talk a little bit about your uh, work with the antivirals. Mm -hmm. Tell us what you've been doing. How'd that get started? Well. Uh, right when I joined BARDA, uh, there was a request for proposals put out uh, for the acquisition of 1.7 million treatment regimens of a smallpox antiviral. Uh, and there are a number of antivirals that are, have been in the pipeline and have been worked on at various levels over the years. And there were a number of candidates who would be likely to apply for, for this procurement contract. It's important to differentiate differentiate between an advanced development contract and a procurement contract. Advanced development is still largely basic research or clinical research, whereas procurement is largely you go out and buy it, put it in the stockpile. Uh, and so um, 
when the RFP was submitted, a number of people applied and there was a review process. It turned out because of my relationship uh, with NIH uh, and uh, contracts that were held by an individual company that I couldn't be part of any of the initial review process for this RFP. So I was really kept out of, deliberately kept out of the loop. Uh, and, I, and that was completely appropriate in terms of the work going on uh, uh, in the group. Uh, but this process now has been ongoing for a couple of years in terms of sorting out the, the um, uh, issues related to the procurement contracts. But there will be, uh, at some point in the near future, contracts that will be let to companies that will provide these drugs. And so um, my job initially uh, was expected to be that of something called a uh, project officer. Uh, and uh, that my job, however, has evolved away from that, and now I, I serve as more of a subject matter expert than as a, an administrator. So I play the same scientific role uh, in the antiviral world uh, as I do in the vaccine world. That is, I uh, evaluate the science, I evaluate the literature, I carry on conversations, and I tell people, more or less what my opinions are on various. You've also areas. had the opportunity to site visit places like Bavaria Nordic oh, yeah. and some of the drug developers and that kind of stuff, right? Fascinating. Uh, you know, go to a place that makes pills. I'd never seen that. And it's amazing the sort of things that they do to come out with a little capsule. Um, and so that has been a, uh, been an education. So when you, went, when you arrived at uh, BARDA, you said they issued RFPs, requests for proposals mm -hmm. for these antivirals. So then companies interested would submit Proposals were you Correct. involved in the review of those? Not or? of those. No, that, I couldn't be it. involved in that. I've been involved oh, in plenty of that, review yeah. with uh, for other issues. We have uh, now because we have this substantial advanced development uh, support program, uh, we solicit applications quarterly, and so the applications come in two phases. First, a ten-page white paper is submitted, uh, and we sort among those for the ones that we think uh, might be of interest to us. And then we give these people an opportunity to write a full proposal. And these proposals range from uh, 100 to 150 pages, though we did recently read a proposal that was 750 pages. <laughs> so it's a whole different reality from reading an R1 grant. Uh, and the requirements of the people who apply for these contracts are, are remarkable by academic standards. There are, are safety issues and uh, manufacturing issues. And, regulatory issues and quality control and, and uh, a whole bunch of words that just don't have a place in an sure. academic lab. So at any rate, for companies that, uh, that achieve a high enough grade, then they go into negotiations with the government in terms of specific contract uh, expectations and dollars and cents. And uh, when they're awarded, uh, generally it's worth a lot of money. And they also accept a lot of regimentation. It's very different from the grant world. Each contract is written so that there's a base year and then some number of option years, and the government has a right to stop a contract on a dime and pull the money. And it's, it's a very different world. Um, there isn't necessarily the expectation that all of the option years will be filled. These people are, the contractors are required to participate in weekly or biweekly teleconferences. There are month, detailed monthly reports. There are quarterly reports often. There's a year-end report. Uh, there are quarterly site visits uh, to the contractors. And you participate in all of that I stuff. I participate right? in all of that stuff, yeah. Right. So the, the, the companies who are interested in these uh, contracts, they already had a candidate antiviral? By the time they get to us, they've had a candidate that's gone through a phase one safety and efficacy okay. trial. So they, most of them have been funded by the Department of Defense or the National Institutes of Health mm -hmm. to get that far. Uh, and so they are generally reasonable candidates, although more, uh, more and more we're seeing um, uh, applications from uh, large pharmaceutical companies who are interested in sharing development costs uh, with uh, some of their candidates. And that's, um, uh, that is an attack that's appreciated by the government. And the idea here is that the government has mandated that we need these preparedness things uh, but uh, the normal process, I mean, it's expensive, and the normal commercial process for developing that stuff just isn't going isn't to cut it. So the government has to chip in the big bucks through you to see to it that this makes it 
to the end, right? So you're doing it, phase it, two and phase, not yes. phase, but you can't do an efficacy in people, obviously. Right? Not for any of the biodefense uh, related it's animal uh, rules, right? it's, but it's, for it's, it's an antibiotic, as an example. Yeah. Um, uh, they would do efficacy studies uh, in a, a human clinical population for a clinical bacterial infection, and they would define uh, the dosages sure. required for that. The trick then is to do the uh, animal studies uh, with the biodefense agents in the specific animal models, and then relate the dosages between the animal models and the humans. Sure. Right? That's, that would be the, uh, the okay. approach. So as long as the safety studies for the antibiotic that are used in humans um, don't contradict the levels of drug that would be needed uh, for the biodefense agents, then all of the clinical safety studies and efficacy studies done in humans for a human clinical case count towards right. the argument for the biodefense uh, agent. And that's particularly good in antibiotics because there's a dramatic need for new antibiotics, uh, better antibiotics uh, because of the uh, uh, incre increased reality and awareness of multidrug resistant bacteria. So what's the status of the smallpox antiviral? Well, there are a couple of drugs that are, are uh, under development and under consideration. And so, uh, there is nothing uh, ready to be uh, distributed. Uh, so anyway. you don't have a candidate for stockpiling yet. You have several. Uh, in reality, we don't have a candidate that's ready to be stockpiled. Right. Yeah. Where did the 1.7 million doses come from? What? Uh, that raises another whole interesting Actually, it's not, it's not doses. <laughs> it's therapeutic regimens, you therapeutic said. Therapeutic regimens, that's right. How many, that's how many doses? Well, it depends upon the drug. I mean, it could sure. be as few as five, or it could be 20, or, you know, depending on the regimen okay. that's prescribed. Um, there is a part of uh, government that decides requirements, and so... Uh, they uh, acquire the background information that they need in order to make a judgment. Uh, and it's generally a, a, a committee-derived uh, discussion um, based on the, what they know uh, and they, based on various scenarios of uh, release of the agent and the biology of the agent, how far it will go and what the wind will so do. So 1.7 million must be some calculation of like healthcare workers and ring vaccination or, or yes. uh, treatment out from a, an epicenter or something okay. like that, somebody's, somebody's calculation. I, w I, would, I certainly would like to think that um, people thought seriously about this. And, well, I'm sure they know, did, and, you know, a lot and, of models. made lo logical deductions yeah. about it. Right. But uh, as an example, I'm sure if you ask 10 people uh, about a number, not just this number, but any number, you know, it's like throwing a deck of cards in the air to some extent. You do your very best with the information that you have, but it's not foolproof, and other people can disagree with you and still be reasonable people, you know. So uh, it's a start. It seems like a reasonable start to me. Uh, and uh, what we need to do is get the first drug, uh, and, and then once we've gotten that, then we can. That 1.7 million, the, that's an initial requirement. And, that's uh, an initial requirement, yeah. Presumably, if you've got something that seems to work, the, there might be a, uh, something down the road that says, okay, we're going to stockpile more of this stuff. That's right? correct. Uh, perhaps you would want more of the same, or you would want the same amount of another drug, or you know, some percentage of another second drug in case you needed it. That's going to be a new requirement. That'll be a new requirement. That's exactly right. right. People, people. See, I learned quick. There you Good, go. Good, huh? <laughs> yeah. Uh, there are people who think about these things. That's not me. You know, right. I wouldn't even know where to begin, uh, right. to be honest with you, to think about this. Uh, but uh, you know, there are mavens who uh, do that as their job. So. Uh, you came into this after a long career as an academic scientist. If I've just got a bachelor's degree, or I've just got a PhD, or fresh out of a postdoc, I decide I don't want to be an academic scientist. I listen to this on TWIV, and this sounds like an interesting opportunity. Is there a job for me? There may be. Uh, uh, background uh, plays an important role. I have this job because smallpox and vaccine are closely related. Uh, were that not true, I may have gotten the job anyway based on other background uh, characteristics that I have, but maybe not. Uh, the group that I work with has grown over the past five years from four to more than 50. And um, of that group, I probably about 40% uh, have PhDs. Um, there is a mix of both federal employees and contractors. Um, 
there is a hierarchy in the organization. There are, uh, there is the director, and under the director there are chiefs, and chiefs have under them project officers, and project officers run the projects. Uh, and so, for instance, um, uh, my chief is the chief of um, broad spectrum antimicrobials. That's the name of the group. And uh, he has the responsibility of overseeing both antibiotic development uh, and antiviral development programs. And so there are project officers associated with each of the projects uh, that are currently uh, ongoing. Um, I am a project officer by title, but I don't do that. Uh, and I'm, <laughs> and I'm, I'm very happy to say that people recognized uh, my temperament as well as my talent uh, in, in making these decisions. Uh, a project, uh, each project uh, requires a team. Um, there is the project officer who is responsible for uh, overseeing the technical aspects of the project, and the project officer has under him or her uh, a program manager who takes care of the local financial details and program day-to-day -day activities. Uh, and then there's one or more subject matter experts, uh, and that's my role. Um, their project officer interfaces with someone called a contract officer, and the contract officer is the chief financial person, and the contract officer actually signs the papers and is personally responsible for everything that uh, they sign. And so it requires uh, a effective teamwork uh, among that whole group in order for a project to actually be overseen. And when you think that some of these projects are worth a half a billion dollars, uh, you can easily imagine that uh, you need that kind of personnel and input in order to right. effectively uh, uh, work these projects. What was new to me and I find very interesting is the role of, of contractors in the process. Uh, contractors work for contract organizations like TNEL or SAIC. Um, these are, uh, these are uh, uh, employment organizations that find jobs in government for people with technical backgrounds. Um, these people may be scientists uh, or they may be people from pharma who worked in uh, uh, filling um, uh, the uh, expertise in terms of filling or lyophilization or transportation uh, or in cell culture or in, in large volume uh, reactors. Uh, all of the things that you would never expect to find in government but play an essential role in terms of drug and vaccine development because a large portion of our responsibility is the manufacturing component. Since we are procurement, it's our job to oversee everything from the genesis of the drug or the vaccine to its filling into vials, its lyophilization, its transportation, its distribution. And so I can't do that. Uh, and there, none of us can do that process by ourselves. And so it's really essential that you have these people who've had 20 years of experience working for Pfizer or something come down and work for us as contractors. And they do a great job. Uh, and they play an essential role in every aspect of, uh, of the process. So, for example, Mershlinsky is a contractor now. Is that right? Yes, Mershlinsky is a contractor, right. So what is he, what's, his, what's his product? Well, uh, his his product is this wonderful understanding of how the FDA works okay. and blending it with his uh, his uh, um, productive experience as a high quality scientist. So in, he has so a in, very unusual expertise. Right. So and so in in Barda, you need to know uh, what's going to be necessary to get this product through the F FDA. And Merschlinski is your pro uh, your your contractor to help you understand that. He is very helpful in terms of being able to interface. Uh, uh, at least, I, I shouldn't say he does not interface. There is actually a separate group uh, called uh, Regulatory and Quality Affairs. Uh, these people are also part of the team, and it's their job to look for regulatory issues and to interface with them. I can't FDA. believe that I'm hearing all of this stuff come out of your face. <laughs> uh, I, I, find, I find it remarkable, uh, to be honest with you. I, I, I have to say I have to check myself every once in a while to see if it's me talking or somebody else. Yeah. yeah. You have a, a wonderful collection of acronyms. Yeah, it right. Is, it, and you've got organizational charts in your head and all this kind of stuff. It took a long time. Uh, you know, you know me. I rebelled for a long time. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> I can imagine. So, uh, it, well, it you, seem to have, uh, you seem to have you seem to have assimilated the whole thing pretty well. Yeah. Well, I, I wouldn't have done it without Mike. Uh, there is no question about that. Uh, the, this is a really interesting group of people. 
Um, I'll get back to your question about jobs because that's, I think that's important. Uh, but this is an unusual group of people in the fact that virtually everyone who works in this group has had some prior experience in, uh, in government, uh, in manufacturing, uh, as a scientist, something of that nature. Uh, there is another fellow, one of my colleagues, uh, is another biochemist who was a, he was a professor uh, at a university. He's the only other person who has an academic background uh, in the group. That background uh, by itself is not helpful in terms of, of doing this job. One has to be prepared to go through a significant transition uh, in order to be able to work effectively in the government. Um, I found that uh, success um, uh, as a scientist and uh, uh, in teaching and that sort of stuff uh, has great value, don't get me wrong, uh, but it's not good enough to get you through the job. Uh, there's a lot more to do uh, in order to do that. And, uh, and you know, recently in a conversation, you raised the issue about being a dean as opposed to being a professor as being a reasonable uh, analogy, and I think that's probably true. All of a sudden, you find yourself uh, in a position where a running an effective lab is irrelevant. You know, you have another whole set of responsibilities and priorities and another whole group of people um, that you have to learn how to interact with who don't know anything about your past life. And they don't they have care. no interest. That's right. right. They have no interest. Uh, and so um, um, I think that's true now uh, as well. Um, and it's okay. I, you know, I, I've learned how to adapt to it. I, was, I have to say I was a little bit shocked to begin with. Um, more than a little bit shocked, I think it's fair to say. Uh, and, and it took me a bit of time to come to grips with this. Uh, and so I'm, I'm very happy that I did because I think it's, uh, uh, it has been a rewarding period of my professional life. In terms of jobs, I think that it's important for people who are interested in uh, a government career, and I, I encourage anyone to consider this because I think it's a great uh, it's a great way to to put your scientific experience uh, to a good practical use. Um, there are a couple of things that you need to do. Uh, one is to keep track of employment advertisements on a uh, website called usajobs.gov, usajobs.gov. Uh, that'll give you an idea of what sort of opportunities are available. Um, there are also a number of fellowships uh, that, for which one can apply uh, that I think are really useful for people who are interested in government work. Several of the younger people uh, uh, with whom I work who are in their 30s or maybe 40 and have worked for the government uh, uh, got their job first by being a AAAS fellow, a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, there are other fellowship programs like that. I don't happen to have the names on the top of my head. But there is also an excellent fellowship program at the FDA where they're very much interested in taking people uh, with a technical background and teaching them regulatory science. Okay. And, uh, uh, and I would encourage anyone to look into those opportunities. Uh, as a third option, uh, I would recommend that you do a postdoc in Washington and decide whether or not you like life in Washington. There are plenty of opportunities at NIH or Georgetown or, or George Washington University. Uh, the USDA has a great program in Beltville um, if you're interested in any agricultural uh, science. And uh, I would encourage anyone to uh, par uh, participate as a postdoc and then decide whether or not you like living in the DC area. And, and when, it, you're much better off looking for a job when you're close by than looking from a distance. Right. Uh, and so if you want to consider that, uh, then I would recommend those steps. There are also jobs in the Department of Defense, and, you should, and don't overlook those jobs. There are plenty of program jobs, opportunities for people. Is the smallpox project in the foreseeable future going to be finished, and can you see yourself either moving on to something else or finishing? I can see myself finishing. I, can, uh, I, I have a commitment, uh, a personal commitment to uh, oversee the, or participate in the initiation of one or more antiviral contracts. I think that's what I was hired to do and I want to stay to do that. Um, but at that point, I think that it would be time for other people to take over. I think that over the period of time, I've been able to help train isn't the right word, but educate the people with whom I work about the important issues associated with pox virus antivirals. And uh, 
uh, I would like to think that they would be ready to take on the responsibility without me. I, I think that they're pretty well suited to do it now if they had to. Then you got grandchildren to play with. I have grandchildren to play with. I have to dust off the golf clubs. Uh, uh, I have uh, uh, no end uh, to the number of interesting things to do in, in DC. I would have to, have to say for people who are, are considering a job like this, uh, I think Washington's a wonderful place to live. Sure, I, I, I and certainly I would enjoy encourage it. This people is great. to consider it. Yeah, so I, I love visiting here. I'd live here. Uh, and my first time in Arlington looks great. Yeah, it's wonderful. I have to tell you two guys, you talk really similarly. Uh, you know, as I watch that video <laughs> that I made, yes. okay, I can see Ed's mannerisms in me. Sure. Yeah. You, you saw each other every day. Yeah. You talked a lot. You have right. a similar cadence. It's a, it's a little spooky. In your voices. You're absolutely right. It's not bad. It's just clear. <laughs> I've never, I don't, did I ever meet you, Ed? Years I think ago? I've been once or twice at meetings, you know, over the years, but it's, I visited, you know, we've been I did, in the business a long time. I did visit Buffalo once. It was a, a symposium, and I think I mm -hmm. sat at a table with you in your lab. Um, yes, that's where it was. Yeah, uh, Bill Russian. Bill that's Russian, that's right. Yeah. And we talked about translation, because right. you, you had an interest in translation, yes. right? Caps. Yeah. Yeah. Caps are involved in that, so I did meet you then. But yeah. I didn't know uh, Rich at the time, but now seeing you together sitting here, you have very similar speaking mannerisms. And, uh, but that's to be expected for guys that hang out a lot. Right. right. It's not a bad thing, just telling you. Want to do some email? Sure. That was great. Are we done, Eddie? Sure, I'm, I'm done, yep. Okay. Uh, we have one from Ashley who writes, I'm a huge fan of TWIV, and thank you and the others for taking... Time out of your busy schedule to do the program. I have my BS in biology and chemistry and would love to go back to school. I read textbooks, listen to podcasts from iTunes U and so forth because the information about the world around us is free. I'm about to begin producing my own podcast and wondered if you would answer a few questions regarding how you go about producing yours. Mine is going to be a library of general science podcasts specifically for Christian homeschool students. The point is to provide extra material that can be coupled with their daily lessons, making learning fun. Hope to hear from you soon. One, what auto edit, audio editing software do you use? Well, Ashley, I record our conversations in a free program called Audacity. You can find that online. And then I edit afterwards also in Audacity. I then export from Audacity and import it into a program called GarageBand where I do a little sweetening of the audio and add the music at the beginning of the end. But if you're on a PC, you, you, you have to use something else. Uh, is there a vid video editing software you use? Yes, when we do video, I use Final Cut, uh, which is a program made by Apple, but there are equivalents on the PC as well. How do you go about having multiple guests via Skype? Well, you can do conference calls in Skype. I call up Rich and Allen very easily. You just select two numbers in Skype and you dial them at the same time. You can do up to 25 people, I think, although that would be hard to do that many people. But that's very easy in Skype. Now, recording Skype is not as, as straightforward as that because you have to do some tricky things. Finally, would you be willing to be a guest on my show once it's up and running? Sure. And I'm sure Rich would be as well. Absolutely. Uh, David writes, would you have any recommendations on a good primer into microbiology that I can read or listen to as an audiobook? I'm interested in extremophilic organisms. I'm looking into reading up during the holidays. Thank you. David is from NC State. I'm sorry we missed the holidays here, didn't we? Uh, by a bit, yep. Do you guys know any microbiology primers? Uh, I do not. No, no, I don't either. All right, so I, I don't, but I know a book by John Ingraham, which talks about the organisms around us. It goes into some extremophiles. It's called March of the Microbes. It's not a textbook, but it is a wonderful introduction you to You know, microbes. there's that pick that Alan had right. a week or two ago. Uh, something about everything you need to know about infections or something written oh, by yes. the Institute of Medicine. Yeah, that was National Academy of Sciences. It was a... Uh, Primer on infectious diseases. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, really short, looked uh, yeah. really good, and maybe it's even got some references in it or something. Yeah, that'd or I'm be sure good. If you contacted those guys, or right, it's not an audio book. No, it's not audio, but it's uh, it's our pick a week a couple of weeks ago, and you can check that out. Although they won't have extremophiles in it, 
but they will have uh, organisms involved in infectious diseases. But anyway, if anyone else, I, I mainly read this because I thought some of our listeners might have mm -hmm. some suggestions, so chime in and help David out. Uh, Jim, our friend from not too far from here in Virginia, who writes us all the time, he sends us a link to a game. A, uh, there's lots of these science games online, and this one is called Philo, P-H-Y-L-O. And it is a game where you do comparative genomics. It is, you, you align sequences, and this is actually sort of a um, aggregate computer type of thing where all the people in the world can do this, and then it helps these people do their projects. Uh, anyway, Jim writes, I tried playing the game for about an hour and ran through the tutorial three times. I made one successful match at the lowest level during that time and don't feel I can learn the rules. Just wonder if TWIV participants have tried the game and how they did. So we'll put the link up and TWIV listeners, try it out. Let us know how you do. I had a couple of whacks at it. It's going to take a little bit of time to learn, but it looks fun, actually. It's an alignment problem, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, next one's from David, who is at Vassar College and has written us before. I think both of you guys know David because he's a pox virologist. And he writes, I'm an assistant professor at Vassar College, just up the Hudson River from you guys. I love TWIF and try my best to keep up with the episodes. I teach courses in virology and microbiology in an introductory biology course in which we explore the fundamental principles of biology from the perspective of viruses. Rather than doing broad survey courses for intro biology, each section is taught by a different professor from the perspective of their field of interest. Mine is on viruses and their hosts. It's great to be able to introduce freshmen to virology right off the bat, and it is actually quite easy to talk about everything important in biology, evolution, genetics, cells, etc., while discussing viruses. That's so true, huh? Yep. I have a blog which was actually inspired by TWIV, and I use it to keep my students thinking about virology outside of the classroom and introduce them to interesting new work going on in virology. I've also had my students write posts, and I'm quite impressed. Keep in mind, these are freshmen. I want to increase activity on it from people outside the college. It would be great and beneficial for students to know that I'm not the only one reading their work, and I bet the quality of their work would increase knowing there's a broader audience. So I'm hoping that we will read this on TWIV and send all those millions, or is it billions, of TWIV fans my way. The blog is called Viva Virology at Vassar, and we'll put a link to that in the show notes. And I would say that those students are very lucky to have David Esteban as a, as a professor because it looks like he's fully engaged and they're getting a great experience. Yeah, it's great. And we will put the link up, David, and uh, I'm sure the TWIV listeners are going to take your website down. You know, when you have too many people hitting a website <laughs> at the same time, servers just can't handle it. Next one is from Damien in Australia. I recently saw this article about a former colleagues group that I thought may be of interest. The article is in Swedish, which I can ne neither read nor speak. I would be interested in your thoughts as to this being another way of targeting influenza. I really enjoy TWIV and TWIP. They are great for a scientist who specialized in chemistry with a limited amount of biochemistry, who studied photosynthesis, oxygen evolving center structure and mechanism as a graduate student in the chemistry school. Keep up the good work. So, you know, you can open a website in Chrome, which is Google's browser, and it will immediately give you an option to translate the page. So I did this with the Swedish one, and it turns out it is about using the M2 protein of influenza virus as a drug target. And this is an ion channel in the virion, and in fact, it is the target of some of the first anti-flu drugs ever made, like amantadine. Right. And amantadine so, doesn't get used all that much more. I mean, it's uh, mostly the neuraminidase inhibitors. Well, some, um, well, m the H3N2 strains, I believe, are all resistant uh, to amantadine. Okay. So that has been a known target for a long time. This mm -hmm. is nothing new, Damien. Um, but I think it's not a bad target to get more. Do you know, any, Ed, do you know anything about using the M2 as a target to get more flu antivirals? Is anybody doing that? No, I don't. Uh, yeah. I really don't keep track of those developmental programs. The next one is from Andre. And uh, where's Andre from? He's all the way at the bottom. Andre's it's got to be from Australia because he starts out with G'day, team. G'day, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> 
<laughs> Good day, Twiv team. I love your show. I have a question on dengue infection and severe hemorrhagic fever, DHF, and shock syndrome that often occurs upon subsequent infection by another serotype. I got aware of Sanofi Pasteur Australia looking for participants for a phase three trial of a live dengue vaccine. See attached brochure and link. It puts a link to uh, this information. I totally see the need for a vaccine. However, when I read attenuated live vaccine, I remembered my Strauss and Strauss textbook and your show episode 82 stating the fact of enhanced severity of disease upon subsequent dengue infection by another serotype. It confuses me, especially after the uh, respiratory syncytial vaccine debacle, that they pursue which seems to be an avenue that could put vaccinated people in a worse position than unvaccinated. They, there are also only limited animal models to mimic the severe disease development upon second infection that could help with vaccine development. I have great faith in the scientific advisory board who regulates clinical trials and also in Sanofi Pasteur to be aware of this fact. So I must have overlooked something that would eliminate my suspicion. I'm really, I'm relieved to find someone who has faith in scientific advisory boards <laughs> and yes. uh, pharmaceutical companies because we hear from so many people who do not. Right. Well, they, the, the fact is that these vaccines will immunize you against all four serotypes. Right. So then you will be protected against all four, and you're not going to get the serious disease. Right? Well, the, the points that he raises, however, are, you know, all of the things that need to be right. <clears throat> considered in the process of developing this. So if it's an attenuated virus, what happens if the immunity is not as good as a, as a wild-type infection? Are you just asking for trouble because you're only getting partial immunity and in, infection would give you something worse? I'm sure that these are all uh, things that are being considered in the process right. of developing these That's very important, vaccines. obviously. Absolutely. Any vaccine has to make a really good response to all four, and so that you and, won't... And my understanding and my understanding in uh, dengue from, uh, actually from my TWIV experience and our visit to <laughs> Florida. Florida Gulf Coast University is that uh, even though it makes sense to have all four in a vaccine, if you're immunized against two, you're well on your way to uh, being uh, protected against other serotypes as well. Is that is that? I don't remember I mean, do that. Do I remember no. that correctly? Or at least protected against hemorrhagic fever. Maybe I got that wrong. I think you have to have all four. Okay. Right. We'll have to check that. Anyway, he has three questions. One, the vaccine is tetravalent, covering all known four serotypes. But you, do you think one can be sure that it will generate a good enough antibody response against all serotypes in all individuals? Do we know all serotypes, and does our grouping into serotypes make sense with regard to predicting hemorrhagic fever or shock syndrome? Well, that's a good question. Uh, nothing is going to do the same in everyone. There will always be people who have suboptimal responses. So that's a really good question. Right. You can do a clinical trial and show, you know, in the majority of people, you get good antibody responses to all four. But I'll bet it's not in 100% of the recipients. I think this, this is what the clinical trials are about. Right. I'm sure those are the questions they're asking. And so you have to, at some point, make a decision, you know, if it doesn't induce a good antibody response in all the people, you may not want to go forward with it because that will make them at risk for serious disease. I think we know that all four serotypes, that's it as far as we know. As right? far as we know. And that's, uh, that's pretty well documented at this point, I think. There's really a lot of background information on these clinical trials. I, I mm -hmm. took the liberty of looking up the clinicaltrials.gov website and keying in dengue tetravalent vaccines and it turns out that there are 19 either ongoing or completed trials, and this is one of those 19, that there are several companies involved. Um, there are two different general types of, of viral vaccines. Uh, one is a set of four attenuated dengue vaccines uh, that's being evaluated by GlaxoSmithKline, uh, oftentimes in association uh, with uh, NIAID, or no, with uh, Walter Reed, excuse me. I believe that's right. Anyway, GlaxoSmithKline versus the Sanofi vaccine, which is a recombinant set based on the yellow fever virus uh, backbone. And so um, 
each have the same goal, and that is to have the appropriate immunogenicity uh, that would provide a sterilizing vaccination. I think that until large-scale clinical studies are done in an endemic region, uh, you're not going to know how good these vaccines are. Right. Uh, that's the bottom line. But there's plenty of evidence to indicate uh, that there is a imagined threshold level of protection provided uh, with the limited studies done to date. And so I think you're, you're stuck with balancing the greater good with the potential issues along the way. I think that's, uh, that's always true in vaccine development. Um, dengue is a particularly pernicious uh, disease to deal with. And so I think all the questions are really great questions. Uh, and I, I'm looking forward to the day when we know the <laughs> answers uh, to those questions, because it will provide a great benefit uh, uh, to the human condition once a, a, an efficacious dengue vaccine is available. Uh, just one more uh, addendum to that recombinant vaccine. I think this is really interesting. It's, uh, it's the platform is the yellow fever virus vaccine, which right. is an attenuated vaccine itself that has a a long and largely successful history. Recently, there's been some uh, issues with some side effects that they hadn't been uh, aware of that they're uh, dealing with. Right. Uh, but um, so you start off with an attenuated uh, virus vector and dengue and yellow fever are very, very similar viruses. So it's just a matter of sticking the uh, two envelope proteins from dengue into the appropriate sites in the yellow fever. You're just uh, right. swapping right. the capsids and making these recombinant facts. So it's, so it's very interesting. Uh, the, his other two questions, one, do you think the vaccine could have been, was tested reliable in an animal model in order to investigate what effect a subsequent natural infection post-vaccination would have in terms of severe disease? I don't know the details of the clinical trials or before that. Do you think that they would have gone in animals before? They certainly would have tested immunogenicity of the vaccine candidates individually and right. as groups in order to measure uh, immunogenicity under various animal conditions. However, I think that the animal models available uh, to evaluate a dengue infection are limited. Right. You're always limited with an animal model under the best of circumstances, and I think that the dengue models uh, are, are. I'm not sure there's a good struggle. challenge model in dengue. Is that right? Well, that's what I mean. A yeah. challenge model. Yeah. So you can so you can see whether or not the animals respond and make antibody, but you don't necessarily have a good. Well, model. there is. A, I believe that the model is a, it's a, an interferon knockout or one of these things. I don't remember okay. what yeah. the specifics are, but it's a, the uh, innate re the, the initial interferon response is struck right. down. I mean, there are the mouse models of I'm aware of involve a mouse adapted dengue strain, and then using uh, certain strains of mice, as you Stat say, knockout or something like that. Yeah, and then you can show if you give those mice antibodies passively and then infect them, you can get the severe, more severe disease. Oh, okay. Whether they have been used by these companies, I don't know. They are relatively recent developments, so I have a suspicion that they have not been used. But uh, that could be wrong. And finally, the participants in that phase three study will not be challenged with virus after vaccination, of course. So only blood work will be available to tell their immunity status. By doing so, do you think the status of protection against dengue can be assessed? And as you said, uh, Ed, this will have to be done in an area endemic for dengue. And that will serve as the efficacy, right? Well, you know, I think that there must be zero surveys um, available from dengue recovering people. To give you some idea of some what idea. sort of exactly. level of antibody, serum antibody right. provides protection. That's right. So because people don't get right. subsequently infected by the same serotype. So um, if you can achieve that level of immunogenicity, then at least arguably you would say you're in the right ballpark. Arguably. Um, though the full immune response that's required to completely protect in a dengue infection probably is open to. Mm -hmm investigation. But you would essentially immunize a, a cohort and have them go about their normal lives and exactly. then measure the incidence of dengue and serious dengue yes. afterwards. And you would hope to see a decline as a, in the immunized population. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, that's what you would hope. Yeah, Because you, yeah. you can't challenge them, obviously. Right. All right, Andre, those are all good questions. Um, I'll put up a link to the clinical trials. And I also found a very nice article um, 
discussing all these issues. We'll put a link to that as well and the uh, nature of the yellow fever backbone vaccine. So Andre, thanks. Those are all great questions. Uh, let's move on to, I think we have to move on to um, our picks of the week. Rich, what do you have for us today? Right. So I think the first time, one of the first times, one of my first picks on this show was a book called The Making of the Atomic Bomb by Richard Rhodes, my probably, famous, my probably favorite science book. My pick today is a book called Dark Sun by the same author, Richard Rhodes, which is basically a sequel to The Making of the Atomic Bomb, and it's The Making of the Hydrogen Bomb. <laughs> uh, and is uh, every bit as captivating as the first book. Actually, the first part of it, uh, uh, if you've read The Making of the Atomic Bomb, the first part reads like he had a whole lot of research left over that he couldn't put in that book, that he put in the first part of this, <laughs> which, is, which is the Russians developing an atomic bomb in parallel with the Americans competing with them. It's what was going on in Russia at the same time. And, uh, and how that related to the American effort, because basically there was stuff about, there was legislation, polit politics about sharing information with the Russians so they'd be our friends rather than our enemies. And they used all that to copy our bomb project, okay? And then the second half of the book is about the development of the hydrogen bomb, and uh, it's downright scary, uh, but a very interesting read. Wow. Well, I guess that's it for his books now, right? Uh, he's, yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> I, hope, I hope there's not another bomb to write about. That sounds good. Uh, Ed, what have you got for us? Uh, I'd suggest people read a, a series of short essays that were published in last week's Science, the February 4th Science, that marked the 10-year anniversary of the announcement of the human genome sequence. And I thought that uh, it reflected in uh, these short essays uh, uh, a perspective of uh, what it took to get the genome sequence project underway uh, and what has happened in the 10 years subsequent. And it, it made me reflect uh, basically on my perspectives on this project uh, from the early days on. And uh, I guess the surprise that it was completed so quickly. And now looking back 10 years, uh, a recognition of how it impacts on virtually everything that happens in science. And it's changed the language and changed the way we think about uh, we think about so many aspects of uh, the human condition. So, it's a short ten essays. It won't take you very long to read them, and hopefully, it will enkindle in you the uh, same sort of uh, appreciation uh, for uh, the benefits of this project. Actually, two two issues came out, part one and two, and they have about ten essays in each one. They have Collins, Francis Collins, and Craig Venter in one. And then Desmond Tutu writes about his G my genome. Wow. And, well, uh, that must be this week's. Is that today's? Uh, yeah, February science? 11th yeah. is the second part. Is an interesting one. The Genome Project, What Will It Do as a Teenager? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good title. Yeah, you should read both. Uh, one, they have a few podcasts associated with them, or one podcast uh, associated with it as well. Will Computers Crash Genomics? It's good stuff. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ed. Oh, well, my pick is a uh, article in the Los Angeles Times of all places, and it's by Wendy Orent, and it is called, and I'm not terribly fond of this title, but the name is The Polio Virus Fights Back. And it's all about uh, the WHO's effort to eradicate polio and the problems they have had in doing that. And it's a nice uh, recounting of it. And, uh, Wendy Orrent spoke to me uh, a few weeks ago when she was working on this article, and uh, some of that is in here. But it's an interesting take on what's going on and what we need to do to finish this problem. I would have called it polio virus fights back. One word, not two words, and I wouldn't put the in front. But I am not the headline writer, of course. The subheadline is Sabin's oral vaccine is actually causing new outbreaks of the disease. And as we eradicate, uh, that is the problem with using the, the attenuated vaccine, is that it causes vaccine-associated uh, polio. So it's a short read. Check it out. And that will do it for another TWIV. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, facebook.com slash thisweekinvirology, all one word. Got a lot of fans there now. It's great. 
and you can find out other things about TWIV when you go over there. Of course, you can always listen to TWIV on iTunes at the Zoom Marketplace. And if you do that at either place, consider subscribing so you automatically get each new episode. And on iTunes, you can leave comments which help us stay on the front page of the Medicine Podcast. So do that if you're a new listener. You can also listen on your iPhone or Android device, microbeworld.org has a app for either of those two devices. And if you go to twiv.tv, you can play the episodes right there, download them, and read all of our show notes. As always, send us your questions and comments to twiv at twiv.tv. I also set up a uh, a phone line, 908-312-0760. 908-312-0760. That is a Google voice number, and you can dial it. You will get the... uh, answering machine or whatever you call it. It's not an answering machine, right? It's a, I don't know, some computer it's a out computer. there. It's a computer. Rec- Nobody will answer. You can record a question <laughs> for us if you, and we'll play it on the show. Let's try that out, see if anybody wants to do that. Ed, great talking to you. It's great fun for me, too. I'm really glad to have a chance to contribute. Yeah, I think it's something new for uh, TWIV listeners to hear this kind of a post-career uh, venture and it's really interesting and what you're doing is incredibly important so uh, thank you for uh, talking about it and having us in your home as sure well, well I'm, you're welcome anytime not only uh, not only do we have to be talking on uh, <laughs> through this microphone well we'll be back for study section in the fall Alexandria is a great place I like it Easy in the fall place to be, visit. be a little warmer in October yeah. I will put a link to the Barda web page for everyone to check it out there's a lot of information there Rich, thank you. Great fun as always. You're going to hang out a few days here with Ed, right? Going to hang out till uh, till Sunday and then go home. You going to talk a lot? Probably. Play golf? No. Too cold. I right? don't think, right? It's too cold. Uh, well, yeah, I think there may be a few diehards out, but I'm not that much of a No, <laughs> it's, it's cold. It's cold. We'll go into D.C. and hang out. Yeah, do the museums, museums, do the monuments. Like There's plenty to do there. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Yeah, great. Rich Condit is at the University of Florida, Gainesville, home of the Gators. That's right. bit.ly slash poxdoc. And I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs> <laughs>